Hi there. Uh, I want to show you a clip from... Oh, that's not right. Hang on. That's better. I painted. That blue is killing me. Anyway, I want to show you a clip from the 1987 movie Wall Street with Charlie Sheen. This is a drama about the miserable coke-snorting bastards who ruined the U.S. economy throughout the 80s with their stock market shenanigans. And in this scene, Sheen's character is entrenched in the act of industrial espionage when he pulls out some documents from a filing cabinet and starts rolling some kind of black box over them. When I saw this, my brain went into a flat spin. I know just enough about technology, especially in this era, that when I saw this, I immediately put two and two together, and what was shocking to me was just that this thing seemed so obvious once I realized what it was. It is, of course, a portable Xerox machine. It makes perfect sense. He's spying. He doesn't want anybody to know he took the documents, so he's going to make copies on the spot, but where is he going to get access to a Xerox machine? So, of course, he brings one with him. Perfectly reasonable, except such a machine doesn't exist, or at least that's what I thought. And it could just be a movie prop, but of course we wouldn't be watching a video if that were the case. Obviously I have one. And of course when I say I have one, what I really mean is that I have two, and when I say I have two, I of course mean that I have six. The device in the movie is the Silver Reed Portacopy, and there was actually a short-lived but somewhat busy market for devices like this. I have a variety here to show off to you, but first, for those of us who aren't so saturated with late 80s technology, we've already sussed out how this thing works, let's take it from the top. So here it is, and it doesn't look like much. If you're familiar with 1980s electronics, you might think at first that this is just a really big electric razor. On the side, we have a charger input, and on the front, a charge light. So this has a battery, which you wouldn't miss because it weighs about three pounds. On the other side, we have a contrast adjustment and an on switch. Turning the machine on pops off the cover. Under here, we see where the paper exits, and this paper is fed from a continuous roll up here. This is thermal paper, meaning when you apply heat to it, it turns black. You can test if something is thermal paper by just dragging your fingernail across it, because friction will also activate the dyes. This means, of course, that inside of here, there's a thermal printer, which was and is a common way to print black and white images, particularly text. On the back, we also have this latch, which releases a pressure roller that holds the paper against the print head. And if we look here at the business end, there's this glass window, this rubber roller, and then these three nubs sticking out, which connect internally to a micro switch. And that's pretty much all there is to it. All the details we'll get from the outside. The exterior doesn't suggest much about how it's actually used, but here's what it looks like. I turn it on, I press it against an interesting document, and I roll. And as I roll, it ejects this paper out the back. When I'm done, let's tear it off. We have a nice, crisp, black and white duplicate. Now, how cool is that? Doesn't look half bad. I mean, it's a little splotchy, but so were photocopies and faxes, which were both pretty high tech in 1986. I can't begin to describe how useful this would have been in its heyday. It's just endless. Imagine doing research at the library. You find an interesting paragraph in a book. Your options are to either write it down by hand or take it to the Xerox machine and photocopy the whole page for probably 10 cents, wasting most of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, or you could bring one of these, copy just the part you want, and use up two inches of paper, which contains nothing except the text you're interested in. You could copy phone numbers out of the phone book, copy recipes out of a recipe book, you could copy advertisements out of a magazine, anything that isn't an eight and a half inch by 11 sheet of paper, you could copy with this thing. And I don't know of any other device I've seen that does that. We'll talk about how satisfying it is compared to my fantasies in a bit, however. First, let's talk about how it works. When the porta copy is copying, the window on the front lights up red. You might recognize this behavior from a much more well-known category of device, the computer palm scanner. These were popular in the late 80s and early 90s, at least with people who had scanners at all at that time. They were convenient for scanning small things like pages out of books and receipts, that sort of stuff. You just get your document, put your scanner up against it, press the button, and then drag down slowly, and it copies it line by line into your computer. Now, this one actually has green LEDs in it, which was a feature at the time. A green illuminator would render red text legibly, whereas a red illuminator, like the one in here, would make that text invisible. I don't know why they picked red for this one, knowing that, but besides that minor difference, these look pretty similar. They do share a lot of DNA, to be sure, but you can't quite say this is just a scan man married to a thermal printer. There are some significant differences in how they work. 
The LEDs illuminate the document, and then what captures the image is a type of sensor called a linear CCD. This is similar to what's in a digital camera, but in a camera the CCD is two-dimensional. It's a rectangle onto which you focus a complete image. When you press the shutter button, the camera captures the whole picture all at once, producing a bitmap with a fixed width and height. The linear sensor in the hand scanner, or in fact the portacopy, however, is a one-dimensional sensor. It's just a strip that records one row of image data at a time. If you've ever used a flatbed scanner, they also have linear sensors, and that's why they have that moving bar inside. To make a complete two-dimensional image, you have to move the sensor slowly, taking picture after picture, and then put them all back together at the end to assemble the completed image. This is a slow process, so these aren't great for normal photography, but for documents, they're fantastic. A document camera using a two-dimensional sensor would have to be a foot or two away to see the entire page at once, and it would be limited to a specific width and height, but the linear CCD can be smashed right up against the document, and it can take a scan that's as long or as short as you like. Since you can move it very slowly and take a lot of pictures very close together, the effective resolution can exceed most cameras. This flexibility is why linear image sensors continue to dominate the world of copiers and scanners. Of course, in 1986, the digital camera was also virtually non-existent, so the linear CCD was the only choice for the portacopy to begin with. But it was also curiously convenient given the output method they chose, the thermal printer, because the thermal printer is one of the only linear printing technologies. This is a thermal print head, similar to what you'd find in the portacopy. It's a very thin strip of what are basically toaster heating elements, little tiny metal slivers that can be heated up on command. The thermal paper is held against the head by a spring-loaded roller, and by rotating it to move the paper across the head while turning on the elements corresponding to the dark pixels in each row of the image, a picture can be built up one row at a time. In other words, its principle is the exact opposite of a linear image sensor. They even look the same. Since the print head is the same width as the paper it's printing on, it doesn't have to move back and forth like an inkjet would, for instance. The printer moves the paper under the head, and every time the head is energized, it prints a whole row at once, and then it can stop at that point. It doesn't need to print anymore. It can just sit there and wait for the next row. This means you don't have to buffer a complete page of data ahead of time. You can generate and transmit your picture on the fly. Now, I don't know if technologies like bubble jet printing had been miniaturized or even invented by 1986, but thermal printing is still a great fit for this kind of device because the streaming nature of it is compatible with the streaming nature of how the device is used. As you're rolling it across the document, it's continuously gathering new data. Being able to print it out on the fly as it's gathered is ideal for the user mechanically, but it's also ideal given the very limited computer resources of this era. This device contains a microcontroller, a little computer that takes the data from the image sensor and hands it off to the printer. Now if you want to store that image data, you're going to need a frame buffer, which were notoriously expensive throughout the 80s. In 1986, computer memory had come down considerably from where it was in the early 80s, but it was still pretty expensive, and it was a limiting factor in computer graphics of all types. But not so much in this device, I think. Consider that since the image is pure black and white, no shades of gray, no color, each pixel that it captures is a single bit, not even a byte. Now imagine the CCD is 512 pixels across its length. That means that each line it captures is about 512 bits, or 64 bytes. If you were to scan an 8.5 inch page across its full width at that resolution, it might take up 32 kilobytes of RAM, which in 1986 was still about 4 to 5 dollars. Now, in today's dollars, that's like 20 bucks, so manufacturer would sure love to save 20 bucks on manufacturing costs. So instead, imagine if you only stored one line at a time. 64 bytes of memory is so small, you might actually be able to store it in the built-in registers of a microcontroller and not use any external RAM chips at all. I would take it apart and find out if this is actually true, but I tried that, and it's so hard to actually get to the PCB without destroying it that I gave up, so you're gonna have to just live with my guesses. But certainly there are other ways that they saved money on these things. To illustrate that, let's go back to the scan man. On the bottom of the scan man, there's a rubber roller which rotates when you drag it across the document. It's connected inside to a rotary encoder, a component that tells the microcontroller how far and how fast the user is moving, so it knows how often to record new rows of image data. If the user moves it faster or slower, the encoder tells the computer how to reassemble the image data with the right dimensions. Looking back at the portacopy, it also has a roller, but it doesn't spin freely. I have to apply some force, and when I do, that causes it to advance the paper, even if the power's off. I mentioned earlier they managed to make the already cheap thermal printer mechanism even cheaper, and they did so by not even putting a motor in it. The rubber roller here is coupled via gears to the print mechanism, so as the user rolls it across the document, it actually ejects the paper mechanically. 
As far as I can tell, the portacopy doesn't have a rotary encoder or any timing circuitry. It just copies and prints as quickly as it can, and since the motion of the device and the motion of the paper are forced mechanically to happen in lockstep, that causes it to reproduce a one-to-one -one image just by its nature. Really, they've stripped this thing down to its absolute bare essentials, removed everything until they found the minimum viable product that would produce an accurate copy without any intelligence, without any extra components, no sensors. They've just made this thing as dumb as possible. Of course, this has limits. If you move it too quickly, it'll start skipping lines, but that's an intrinsic problem with any hand-operated scanner. And really, how often are you copying documents in a panic? I mean, if you are in a burning building and you're trying to rescue your tax files from the fire, don't bother because your thermal paper is going to turn black from the heat anyway. With the motor and rotary encoder and possibly other things stripped out, this is about as bare bones as it can possibly be. It doesn't get much simpler than this. And you've seen everything it can do. It copies. That's what it does. The only control I haven't used is the contrast knob, which does about what you think it does. And that makes sense because the concept is so simple. It's just taking two technologies that were widely available in the mid 80s, gluing them together with the minimum possible number of components to produce something that performs a broadly appealing task. It doesn't seem like there's much room for innovation here, but let's look at the rest of the market and see what clever ideas they had. We've got two silver reed porta copies, a copy jack 40, a sharp handy copier, a Panacopy Mini, and a Sony Pocket Copier. We'll start with the Copy Jack 40 since it came out the same year as the Portacopy. It's from 1986 as well, but it's smaller and it's blue. It has the same basic layout as the Silver Reed with the paper at this end and the printer scanner head at the other. They've also moved the paper release to the side here and it now has a button for activating it instead of just being able to press it against the document, which is worse. The only other major difference is that they've removed what appears to be a crucial component. The rubber roller is gone, so how is it going to advance the paper? I had no idea until I read the manual. All right, here's how it works. First, you have to grab the paper and pull a couple inches out by hand. Then you put it down against your document, hold the paper in place with your free hand, press the activation button and drag. Well, as you can see, it's quite a bit slower than the porta copy. It also uses this uncomfortably small one and a quarter inch paper instead of the three and three quarter inch paper of the porta copy. And uh, the image also isn't as good, but that's because the batteries are dying. You can actually see at the end here where it started getting corrupted because the batteries were running so low that the computer couldn't operate. The NICADs and all these things are extremely dead. They only really hold enough of a charge for like one copy. I don't really like this width. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what you could copy with this that would be useful. I guess maybe one paragraph out of a book if it was a pretty short paragraph, but for anything else, you're gonna end up having to do multiple passes and you're gonna get a very disjointed copy. But I guess if you're just getting like one phone number out of the phone book, this could be good. And it's certainly a lot more pocketable than the porta copy is. So I guess it has its advantages. Although not having the built-in roller to advance the paper, it's pretty janky. Having to hold that paper in place with your hand, it's really uncomfortable. The Panacopy Mini, also from 86, is the exact same device as the Copy Jack 40, by which I mean they came out of the same factory. Here, look, the controls are all in exactly the same places. Everything about this is precisely identical. The only difference I can find is that the copy jack puts the paper at the end and the panacopy puts it in the middle, which seems worse and I don't know why they did that. Otherwise, it's obvious these came out of the exact same factory. This one's no different than the copy jack. You pull the paper out, put it on the document, press the button and drag. Except that this one has such a dead pack that it can't even make it through one copy. So these three are just variations on a theme, and we'll talk later about how significant that is. But the other two that I have changed the formula quite a bit. The Sharp ZHC-1 Handy Copier from 1987 takes a completely different approach. While it uses three and a quarter inch paper like the porta copy, it doesn't have a three and a quarter inch CCD. In fact, it doesn't have a CCD in the body at all. Instead, the sensor is housed in this wand, and as you can see, it's only about a half an inch wide. That's because this device is not for copying whole paragraphs out of books or whole columns out of magazines. It's for copying individual lines of text. That's why, despite the paper being three and a quarter inches wide, the print head itself is also only half an inch wide. Here's how it works. So I take the wand and press it against the document, press the scan button, and begin scanning. And you'll notice that it's not printing anything yet. When I let go, it starts printing. 
This is still a thermal printer, but it uses a vertical element that's much like a dot matrix printer instead of a horizontal element that's the same width as the paper. So instead of drawing an entire line on the paper at once, it has to scan the head back and forth, drawing an entire column of text at once. It seems like a clever idea for something that's intended for copying lines of text, but I will tell you that Practically speaking, every single time I've seen this style of thermal printer mechanism, it has been in a device that was meant to be the lowest cost product on the market in that category. I don't think that Sharp did this because it was the best approach. I think they did it because it was incredibly inexpensive. There's also just problems with this approach. For instance, the longest line you can copy is the width of the paper, three and a quarter inches. If you try and copy something longer than that, when you get the three and a quarter inches, it just starts printing right away. And then when it reaches the end of the line, it wraps around and begins printing the rest of your scan on the next line. In other words, it performs word wrap, but just in the middle of a word or in the middle of a letter. Now this doesn't help with legibility, which was already pretty bad on this thing. All the prints I've gotten out of this thing have been basically unreadable, and I don't know if it was like this when it was new, but I get the feeling it probably was. Also, while it has switches on top that seem to offer additional features to sweeten the pot here, two of them don't seem to do anything, and the third doesn't seem to do anything useful. I don't have the manual, unfortunately, so I can't figure out what exactly these were supposed to do. The zoom one seems straightforward. It actually enlarges the text when it prints it, which doesn't actually help with legibility, but if this thing was working well, I guess maybe it would. The layout switch, per the blurb on the box, sounds like it's for scanning dual column text, but I don't really know what that would do. And the word versus graphic switch, I'm guessing is some kind of contrast or edge sharpening filter, but it doesn't seem to do anything either. The only option that seems to work is the repeat feature. Because this device doesn't print in real time, that means it has to buffer the scanned image in memory. So it actually has a 32 or 64 kilobyte RAM chip inside of it. As long as it's still on, you can then reprint the image from memory as many times as you want. I can't deny this is an additional feature, but I can't think of any uses for it, and it doesn't make up for how much worse this thing is than the other designs. I don't think photocopying one line at a time is a feature anybody wanted, and I don't think Sharp thought they wanted it either. I think they discovered that half-inch CCDs and half-inch print heads were very inexpensive, and they decided to make a product to put those in, and just hoped maybe somebody would buy it. This thing was $180 in 1987, at a time when the portacopy was ostensibly still selling for $350, so I think that Sharp just wanted to make a really cheap device and found the cheapest components to do it with, and the result was a cheap, inconvenient, ineffective product. My final unit, the Sony HCP C10 pocket copier from 1989, flips the whole concept on its head, literally. It actually has the printer and scanner at opposite ends of the device. It's also the smallest out of all of them, because if you could believe it, Sony found yet another component to remove from this design. Unfortunately, this one stopped working since I got it, so I can't give a proper demo, but I can show you how it would be used. You take the read side, put it against your document, press the button and drag, and it copies the image into memory, but doesn't print it right away. To print it, you flip it over to the print side, and you place that against an ordinary piece of paper. You hit print and drag, and your text is reproduced. This is possible because Sony has removed yet another of the components from this design. They've taken out the roll of paper. In its place, they've installed a thermal transfer ribbon. This cassette contains thermal transfer ribbon. It's this plastic tape, much like audio tape, but instead of an oxide coating, it has a black pigment coating on it. Inside of the copier, you have a thermal head, much like what you'd find in a thermal printer, except that instead of blackening the paper, it heats up the tape, causes the pigment to come off and stick to the paper. This results in the image being transferred, even though the paper is not thermally sensitive. One of the advantages of this approach is that this ribbon is a lot thinner than paper. The amount of ribbon that's stored in this cassette is going to last a very, very long time. A lot longer than the amount of paper you could store in this same area. So this device is less self-contained than the others, but it's also more trustworthy. You're more likely to be able to find plain paper in a pinch than thermal paper. Also, if you do manage to actually run out of the thermal transfer ribbon, but you are able to find normal thermal paper, you can take the cassette out and print on that, since this is a normal thermal print head. Although I don't think Sony intended that or documented it. The Sony has a zoom switch, just like the Sharp, and it has a memory select switch. Here's Sony's suggestion for how to use that. They propose that if you're labeling a bunch of tapes, you could first scan the genre, store it in memory one, then switch to memory two and scan the name of the first tape. You can then keep the genre in memory one and switch back to it repeatedly to label each tape while you replace what's in memory two, so you don't have to rescan the genre over and over. This feels very much like a solution looking for a problem to me. I can't imagine anyone actually doing this, but there's Sony's big feature.
This is by far the most expensive feeling device out of the bunch. It has a removable battery instead of a permanently installed one. The controls and the chassis just have more detail to them. They feel better in the hand and none of that's surprising since you'd expect Sony to put a little more expense into this than the other companies. That's sort of their thing. Despite the fact that this sold for the lowest price out of all of them when it was new, $160, that was also in 1989 when electronics just cost a little bit less than they used to. That said, Sony could have been taking a loss on this to try and force their way into what they thought was a growing market, which is the weirdest thing about all of this. As far as I can tell, it wasn't a growing market. It was dying almost as soon as it was born. The first year these were available, three different models hit the market, and in the next year, a whole bunch more came out. Plus Corporation made a bunch of other sizes of copy jack, Panasonic made another Panacopy, Radio Shack rebranded that and sold it at their stores, and I'd say the fever pitch of the whole thing was Ricoh's offering, the QVAX MC50. Of the copiers I found, the QVAX is the one I really wish I could have gotten for this video. It looks very different than the others, but the basic concept is very similar, really. The difference is that instead of moving it over the document, you just put it over what you want to copy, center it in the window, and then press copy, and then a motor moves the scanner over the document while the thermal printer prints it out on the glass platen on top. So, sort of the same thing as the others, just rotated 45 degrees and maybe a little less convenient. It, it doesn't look like that big a deal until you look at the accessories. The top unit in this photo is a digital processor which will allow you to flip or zoom the image or connect to a computer so you can actually turn this thing into a computer scanner. This was $450. The other accessory available, because Japan, was a fax adapter which lets you turn this into a little tiny fax machine and that's $480. Since the base unit itself was also $480, which is like $140 more than any of the others, you could spend $1,400 assembling this full kit. I think it's cool that you could spend $1,400 on a pocket-sized thermal printer, scanner, copier combo. I'm not sure though. So with all this going on, this seems like a rip-roaring market, but the provenance of some of these is questionable, if you ask me. There's more going on than it appears. The portacopy was originally sold by Silver Reed, the US branch of Silver Seiko, who seem to be unrelated to the watch manufacturer. They are instead a typewriter manufacturer. That seems to be all they ever made, except for this. The copy jack is made by Plus USA, the US branch of Plus Corporation, a Japanese stationery company that makes things like notebooks and whiteboards, and as far as I can tell, no other electronics, except this. I strongly suspect that Plus didn't make the copy jack and Silver Reed didn't make the portacopy. I think they're both rebrands from some third party. It doesn't help any that we know for a fact that these two devices are rebrands and definitely came out of the same factory, but really, I think that all three of these came out of the same factory. While it is possible that Panasonic OEM'd these for Plus Corporation, it seems weird that Plus would have wanted anything to do with the electronics market, and certainly Panasonic had no need for someone else to rebrand their products. They could sell them just fine on their own brand power. So why did this happen? I found this article in New Scientist magazine January 1987, which is strange. It describes this as a brand new product that hadn't yet hit the market, despite it having been out for four months already but it also does not mention Plus Corporation. It says that this was being made and sold by Kyushu, a subsidiary of Matsushita, also known as Panasonic. I can't find any mention of this Kyushu company producing any other products, but of course maybe they didn't sell them in any markets that I'm familiar with. Since New Scientist is a UK magazine, maybe Plus Corporation wasn't selling this there yet, and Kyushu had decided to sell it under their own brand name in the UK. But if that's true, they never made good on it, so I can't prove that. Whoever they were, I think it's obvious that they made this guy and the Panacopy Mini, and I think they made the Silver Reed as well. There's just too much similarity in the design, like the on switch that also pushes the cap off, and the contrast control being right there, and they just feel like they were designed by the same people, and I don't see any reason to think that they weren't. With this context, what looks like a very busy market with, you know, a half dozen or a dozen devices competing at once is really just one company flooding the market with all sorts of models trying to make this stick, and then three other companies, Johnny Come Lately, popping up later and going, eh, maybe we'll throw something in here. Rico seems to be the only third party that really made any effort to make a unique device, and it cost so much that I doubt very many people bought it. I don't think anybody was really trying that hard to make these devices good, and I think that explains why they're all kind of garbage. Yeah, so about that. I don't really like any of them. I think none of these were ever really good, except maybe the portacopy and, and even then. I'm trying not to hold their age against them. 35 years is a long time. Obviously the battery packs are all shot, and if they weren't, it'd be a lot more convenient to use them. 
Uh, and also their analog components are probably degraded and that's why the print quality is as bad as it is on these. Not to mention the uh, Porta Copies print roller doesn't really hold the paper against the head reliably unless you press on it. So like I said earlier, if you're thinking of going to eBay and buying one of these, my advice is don't. They didn't really stand the test of time. But I don't know that they were ever that good when they were new. What I am holding against these is their ergonomics and ease of use. I think they fail miserably on both fronts. If you ask me, the Portacopy is the best one out of the bunch because of the wide print width, the activation switch on the front instead of on the side, and the roller drive. Without those things, Charlie Sheen would not have been able to copy those documents single-handed, and that is a pretty cool feat. All the same, it's just really irritating to operate anyway. You have to get the head perfectly flat to the paper or it won't press the activation switch. And then you have to keep it perfectly level as you drag to get enough friction on the roller to drive it. And while this is doable in controlled circumstances, I wonder if Charlie Sheen needed 20 takes before he got the paper to feed continuously when holding the whole thing in midair like that. The copy jack is even worse. It requires two hands to operate and you have to hold this slick thermal paper down and try to keep it from slipping with just pure friction while keeping the underlying document held in place and still moving the copier steadily and in a straight line. And it just, it doesn't look that hard, but you're pushing in like three directions at once and it just feels bad. The shape is also not comfortable. And in the case of the copy jack, it's difficult to actually contort your hand to press the activation switch while securely holding the device. It really feels like it needs three hands to operate. It's also just kind of hard to move these things evenly because they're really awkwardly shaped. While the ScanMan, for instance, was big and flat and very stable and wanted to roll in a very straight line, all these copiers are shaped like electric razors. Their heaviest end is up in the air, the contact patch that touches the paper is very small, and they just want to rotate and veer off to the side. Some of these came with little plastic alignment tools, like this Sony one. The idea is you set this on your document, line up the copier, and it acts like a saw fence, helping you keep the unit moving in a straight line. But it was clearly an afterthought, something they made at the last minute. You have to hold the thing down against the paper with your free hand, and it just takes an enormous amount of pressure to get it to stay in place. There's also no actual affordance on the unit itself to mate with this guide. The only thing keeping it in the groove is an incidental ridge in the casting that was clearly not meant for this purpose. This is sort of workable if you're very careful, but again, it's really tedious and finicky and it leaves you with cramped hands. As far as I can tell, this market came into existence in late 1986, and a year later was floundering so badly that some discount house called DAC took out a two-page ad spread claiming they'd bought Silver Reed's entire stock and were dumping it at $99 a piece, less than a quarter the original price, and, if they're to be believed, far less than the manufacturing costs. I can find very little coverage of these products in any magazine after 1986. After their initial release, it seems like nobody cared about them. No reviews, no mention anywhere. Can't even find any for sale after 87, except the Sony product in the back of some magazine just as a model number. If you happen to know what it was, I suppose you could still buy it then. I think this product concept was remarkable, and it could and should have been extremely successful. I think everyone wanted what this thing was offering but it doesn't really follow through on it. None of the ones I showed you today seem to be any good, and I couldn't really find any others on the market. It seems like everybody who tried to make one of these didn't try very hard. I think if these had been a little bit better, built a little better and maybe had a couple more features, then they could have been extremely successful, but none of the companies that made them were willing to take any risks. I think that if you'd put some serious money into this, it could have been decent, but since this isn't a potential billion dollar market, no one was willing to take a risk on it. Anyone who tells you that business or capitalism is about taking risks is trying to sell you something. Businesses don't take risks. They think everything they do is a sure thing until it fails, and then the next thing is also a sure thing until it fails, and so on and so forth. But if someone tells them, eh, this will be okay, but it's not going to do gangbusters, they don't even bother. They don't even want to hear about it. They only want sources of infinite profit. Since this is not a source of infinite profit, it was never going to be very good. Of course, it's also possible that it couldn't have been very good. Technologies like thermal printing and nickel cadmium battery packs were never very good, even when they were new. And in 1986, that's pretty much the best you could do. This thing has a 15 volt nickel cadmium battery pack in it that pulls four amps when you're printing. I checked this with my bench power supply. That's a lot of power and a lithium pack could deliver that. But I suspect that even when this was new, the battery life on it was probably terrible. If they'd waited 10 years and tried making this again with improved battery technology and maybe improved printing technology and hey, maybe even something like dye sublimation printing, these could have been a lot more useful. But unfortunately, once this went in the dumpster, it seems like nobody went back and pulled it back out to try it again. It's a shame. I wish they had. 
But as far as I can tell, that's the end of the story, and that's all I've got to say about it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this, uh, please subscribe. Uh, remember to turn on notifications because I upload kind of irregularly. If you really like this, uh, consider supporting me on Patreon. Here's some of the people that are doing that already, and I'm really grateful to all of them because without their support, I would not be able to afford these things on eBay because everyone on eBay has ridiculous ideas about how much this stuff is worth, as if they don't realize that it's broken garbage that nobody needs or wants. Thank you all so much, and thanks to everybody else for watching.